Daniel Watson, pastor at First Assembly of God in Howe, Oklahoma. In the early 1900s, revivals began sweeping across the Midwestern United States. And out of those revivals came a group of Pentecostals hungry for God to do a work in their life. And on March 24, 1990, First Assembly of God in Howe, Oklahoma was born. And here we are 100 years later, and to commemorate this celebration, we are having a centennial camp meeting. It begins on Sunday, March 24th, and concludes on Wednesday, March 27th. Evangelist Kristen Tomlin will be preaching for us on Sunday morning in the 1040 service, and on Sunday night at the 6 o'clock service. And then on Monday, March 25th, and Tuesday, March 26th, Pastor Torrin Johnson from Impact Church in Alma, Arkansas will be preaching on those nights at 7 o'clock. Our camp meeting will conclude on Wednesday, March 27th with evangelist Don Franklin. We hope that you can be a part of this camp meeting and pray with us and believe that God will do great and mighty things in this church and in our lives and in our community. For more information about our church, you can visit us online at howhe.com. We hope to see you on March 24th, 25th, 26th, and 27th at our Centennial Camp Meeting at First Assembly of God in Howe, Oklahoma. We are reading out of Luke chapter 11. That's where we're going to begin. Luke chapter 11, verses 9 through 13. We have been on the subject now for some time on the baptism of the Holy Ghost. And I believe that it is important that the church of Jesus Christ to be filled with the baptism of the Holy Ghost because without this anointing, without this power, we cannot do the work that God has called us to do. If it has been days since you have spoken in tongues, you need to seek the face of God and pray that God would refill you with the baptism of the Holy Ghost. If you have never been filled with the baptism of the Holy Ghost, if you've repented of your sin, you've confessed Jesus as Lord and Savior of your life, you can be filled with the Holy Ghost. Amen. All you have to do is ask. He said, ask and ye shall receive. Just ask for the Holy Ghost. Just lift your hands and ask Him and, and receive the baptism of the Holy Amen. Ghost. We're in Luke chapter 11, verse 9 through 13. The Bible says, And I say unto you, Ask, and it shall be given. Seek, and ye shall find. Knock, and the door shall be opened unto you. Knock, and it shall be opened unto you. For every one that asketh receiveth, and he that seeketh findeth. And to him that knocketh it shall be opened. Verse 11, If a son shall ask bread of any of you that is the father, will he give him a stone? Or if he ask a fish, will he for a fish give him a serpent? Or if he shall ask an egg, will he offer him a scorpion? If ye then, being evil, know how to give good gifts unto your children, how much more shall your heavenly Father give the Holy Spirit to them that ask? In this passage of Scripture tonight, Jesus is instructing the disciples how to receive the baptism in the Holy Ghost. And tonight, I want to look at several different contexts of Scripture, the, the biblical way that we receive the baptism in the Holy Ghost. See, there are, are, are four different contexts of Scripture. Not four different ways, but there are four different contexts of Scripture that show and teach how we are filled with the Holy Ghost. First of all, we receive the baptism in the Holy Ghost when we spend time in prayer. You cannot receive an anointing. You cannot receive the power of the Holy Spirit unless you are first spending some time in prayer. The baptism of the Holy Ghost is what happens as a result of praying a fervent prayer when you're seeking the face of God. Jesus was teaching the disciples how to pray. In Luke chapter 11 verse 1, the Bible says it came to pass 
that as he was praying, speaking of Jesus, he was praying in a certain place. When he seized, one of his disciples said unto him, Lord, teach us to pray, as John also taught his disciples. And in Matthew chapter 6, verse 5 through 13, the Bible records a time when Jesus was teaching the disciples how to pray. How many of you know it is important that we, as children of God, learn how to pray? Brother Brankel was telling us a story one time when we had our, our Timothy class at Van Buren, and he was telling the story about Jim Cimbala. Many of you have heard of Jim Cimbala, who pastors the, the great Brooklyn Tabernacle Church in New York. But for many years, he had the same 17 people attending his church every week. He would show up for church the next week, 17 people showed up in a city of millions and just 17 people was coming to his church and he began to get discouraged and he was wondering well I must not be doing something right because no one wants to come to church and, and, and the church is not growing we're, we're not seeing anyone get saved and he said he began to go to the Lord in prayer and he said God spoke to him and said Jim if you will learn how to pray fervently and if you will teach your church how to pray and how to get in touch with me you will never be able to build a building big enough your church will never have any debt and today that church seats over 5,000 people they fill it three times on Sunday morning standing room only they're debt free and during the middle of every service they say that in the basement of that church hundreds of people are bombarding heaven through fervent prayer praying for the power of the Holy Ghost to fall in that church. God, that can happen right here at Howe Assembly of God. We can pray and we can let God have His way and He can do what no one else in this world can do. But Jesus was teaching His disciples how to pray. In Matthew chapter 6, verse 5 through 13, Jesus said, And when thou prayest, thou shalt not be as the hypocrites are. They love to pray standing in the synagogues and in the corners of the street that they may be seen of men. Verily I say unto you, they have their reward. But thou, when thou prayest, enter into thy closet, and when thou hast shut thy door, pray to thy Father which is in secret. And thy Father which seeth in secret shall reward thee openly. But when you pray, use not vain repetitions as the heathen do. For they think that they shall be heard for their much speaking. Be not ye therefore like unto them. For your father knoweth what things ye have need of before ye ask him. After this manner, therefore, pray ye, Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done in earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Jesus knew about the power of prayer, and he was trying to convince his disciples about the importance of prayer. Because when we pray, our prayer of faith can move the hands that have created this universe. When we pray, we can move the hands that have made the mountains. We can move the hands that made the valley. We can move the hands that holds this world in place when we pray. Luke chapter 3, verse 21 and 22. It's talking about when Jesus was baptized and he was anointed with the Holy Ghost. The Bible says when all the people were baptized, it came to pass that Jesus also being baptized and praying. The heavens were opened and the Holy Ghost descended in a bodily shape like a dove upon him. And a voice came from heaven which said, Thou art my beloved Son. In thee I am well pleased. The Apostle Paul was a man who was praying when he was filled with the Holy Ghost. And the Bible records his experience in Acts chapter 9, verse 11. The Bible says, And the Lord said unto Ananias, Arise and go into the street which is called Straight, and inquire in the house of Judas, for one called Saul of Tarsus. For behold, he prayeth, and hath seen in a vision a man named Ananias, coming in and putting his hand on him, that he might receive his sight. Then Ananias answered, Lord, I have heard by many of this man how much evil he has done to thy saints at Jerusalem. And here he has authority from the chief priests to bind all that call on thy name. 
But the Lord said unto him, Go thy way, for he is a chosen vessel unto me, to bear my name before the Gentiles and kings and the children of Israel. For I will show him how great things he must suffer for my name's sake. And Ananias went his way and entered into the house and putting his hands on him and said, Brother Saul, the Lord, even Jesus that appeared unto thee in the way as thou camest, has sent me that thou mightest receive thy sight and be filled with the Holy Ghost. And immediately there fell from his eyes as it had been scales, and he received sight forthwith and arose and was baptized. Prayer is the key. Sometimes in life it seems that there are things that are locked up. It seems that the blessings of God have been locked up from coming down into your life. And if you do not pray, you are not going to get any results. Because if there is little prayer, there is little power. But where you see much prayer, you will see much power. It's the same way in the church. If a church has very little prayer, that church will have very little power. But when a church comes together in agreement and they believe together in one mind and one accord and they begin to seek the face of God and they begin to pray and they pray and they believe and they believe and they keep praying until they see something happens, that's when the church is going to have the power. That's when the church is going to have revival. When the people of God come together and pray. That's why the word says, If my people who are called by my name shall humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, that's when we're going to hear from heaven. That's when he's going to forgive us of our sin. That's when he's going to heal our land. Church, it happens when God's people begin to Amen. pray. We must be a praying church. Prayer is the key to unlock the blessings of God. It is important that we learn to pray according to the Word of God. Sometimes people begin to pray and they begin to ask God for things that they have no right asking for. It's the doctrine of name it and claim it and blab it and grab it. They want whatever they want just so it makes them look better in this world. But that's not the way that we are to pray. We pray according to how Jesus has taught us how to pray. We pray according to the word of God. Jeremiah chapter 29 verse 13 says, And ye shall seek me and find me, when ye shall search for me with all your heart. Isaiah chapter 40 verse 31 says, They that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings as eagles. They shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not faint. In 1 Timothy chapter 2 verse 8, Paul said, I will therefore that men pray everywhere, lifting up holy hands without wrath and doubting. In Psalms chapter 28 verse 2, Hear the voice of my supplications. When I cry unto thee, when I lift up my hands toward thy holy place. Yes, when we come together and pray, it is... It's great that we come and we humble ourselves and we pray and we kneel at an altar of prayer and we seek the face of God. It's when we become humble before Him. That's when He begins to lift us up. It's when we humble ourselves before God and we begin to seek the face of God. That is where we will find Him. It's when we will humble ourselves before Him. That's when salvation of our soul can take place. We must humble ourselves before Him or we will never see the kingdom of God. But Sometimes there comes a time in our life when it's time that we stand up, when we lift up our head and we begin to receive the blessing that He has for us. That's when we lift up our hand in total surrender and say, Lord, I am here in Your presence. And we have repented of our sin. And we have turned from the things of this world. And we have come for one purpose, and that is to see God bless us, to fill us with His power, to fill us with His love, to anoint our soul, and to fill us from the top of our head to the sole of our feet with the baptism of the Holy Ghost and the evidence of speaking in tongues in Jesus' name. Amen. And when we begin to lift up our hands, the Bible tells us in Psalms chapter 134, Bless the Lord, bless ye the Lord, all ye servants of the Lord, which by night stand in the house of the Lord. Lift up your hands in the sanctuary and bless the Lord. When you lift up your hands, you are blessing Him. When you lift up your hands, you are totally surrendering your soul to Him. We recognize that we are nothing without Him. So we lift up our hands in total praise to Him. So the baptism of the Holy Ghost is received in the context of prayer. 
Also, the baptism of the Holy Ghost is received when we are in obedience to the Word of God. Amen. God has called each and every one of us in this room to be a witness. You may not be able to go out and knock on doors. You may not be able to teach in a Sunday school class. But everyone can live a life according to the Word of God. You can be a living example. You can be a living sacrifice. And people can see the way that you live your life. They see your lifestyle of prayer. They see your attitude. And they hear the words that you speak. They may even hear you when you pray at work. And when you are acting like that, you are being an obedient to the Word of God and you are living an example of what a true Christian is to be like. We must be a witness. Jesus has commanded us to tarry and to pray until we are endued with power on high because He wants to fill us with an anointing. He wants to fill us with a power and that power is to enable us to do the work that He has called us to do. Amen. In Acts chapter 5, verse 32, the Bible says that we are His witnesses of these things. And so also is the Holy Ghost, whom God has given to them that obey Him. Look at that last phrase of that verse. It says the Holy Ghost that God has given to them that obey them. If a person is, is disobedient, they're not going to receive the baptism of the Holy Ghost. See, we are called by God to be a witness of Jesus Christ. And the Holy Ghost is the one who enables us and empowers us to become that witness. And He is given only to people that obey God. And so the long, to make a long story short, the fact is this. If you are disobedient to God, if you are being disobedient to what the Word of God says, you're not saved. You must be obedient. Salvation is more than just coming to the altar and praying a prayer of faith and going back to your seat. You must be obedient to the Word of God. You must do what the Word of God tells us to do. In Paul's letter to the Hebrews, he writes about the principle of obedience. In Hebrews chapter 5, verse 7 through 9, he's speaking of Jesus and says, who in the days of his flesh, when he had offered up prayers and supplication with strong crying and tears unto him that was able to save him from death and was heard in that he feared. Though he were a son, yet learned he obedience by the things which he suffered. And being made perfect, he became the author of eternal salvation unto all them that obey him. The way of obedience is the way of a Christian life. Jesus was obedient to the Father. He was praying in the Garden of Gethsemane. Father, if it is possible, let this cup pass from me. But he didn't stop there. He went on to say, Nevertheless, not my will, but thy will be done. He understood the principle of dying on the cross to save mankind from their sin. He knew that without the shedding of blood, there would be no forgiveness of sin. So Jesus humbled himself. He became obedient to death and the death of the cross. And so because he was obedient, he became the author of eternal salvation. See, we must understand this fact that Jesus Christ has suffered and he has died on the cross for us. And unless we are obedient to him and unless we follow his word, we're not going to experience eternal life. See, disobedience is what brought sin and darkness into this world in the first place. See, it separated us from God. But Jesus died on the cross. He humbled himself. He went to the cross. And the way was opened up to you and I because of the obedience of Jesus Christ. And so the way is now there. The way is open for you and for me. And Jesus is the way. He said in John 14 and 6, He said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes unto the Father but by me. Where does this obedience come from? It comes from our faith. It's by our obedience we walk in the way of righteousness, step by step, listening to what God has told us to do and living according to the Word of God. And God gives the Holy Ghost to those who obey Him. And so we must be obedient to the Word of God. We must obey what Christ has commanded us to do. You see, the message of the gospel of Jesus Christ is so simple, but yet we fail to obey 
what He teaches us to do. There are many principles in the Word of God that a lot of people in the world that call themselves a Christian are disobeying. It's a, did you know it's a commandment in the Word of God to pay tithes? But so many people neglect to do that. And they, they give their reasons and they give their, their, their scenarios and they say, well, I'm just going to donate my time or I'm going to pay it at another church. That's not the way God said to do it. We must be obedient to His Word. We must be obedient to His command because if we are not obedient, if we are not living the way God te teaches us to live, if we are not coming out from among the world and separating ourselves from the things of this world and, and, and serving God with all of our heart and soul, we are being disobedient and if we are being disobedient we cannot expect to be filled with the baptism of the Holy Ghost. Jesus said in Matthew chapter 28, verse 19 through 20, He told the disciples, Go ye therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost, teaching them to observe all things. Observe means to obey. Teaching them to observe all things that I have commanded you. And lo, I am with you always, even unto the end of the world. When you read in the Bible, when Jesus preached his Sermon on the Mount, you can understand that there is plenty of work for a child of God to do in the church. See, there's none of this business that we hear so many times. Well, the church is so big and there's plenty of other people doing something and so I'll just sit out and let someone else do it. No, no, no. Jesus said... You will receive power when the Holy Ghost comes upon you. If you have been saved by the blood of Jesus Christ, He wants you to tell somebody. Everyone in the church of Jesus Christ has a job to do. Not everyone can go out and knock on doors. Not everyone can stand behind the pulpit. Not everyone can teach a Sunday school class. But everyone can pray. Everyone can be a witness to people that you meet in the community. And every one of us can tell at least one person once in a while about Jesus Christ. Amen. See, when we understand what God requires of us, we need to be filled with the Holy Ghost. James chapter 2, verse 14 through 26 makes it clear about how we should be obedient to the Word of God. In verse 14, he says, What does it profit, my brethren, though a man say he has faith and has not works? Can faith save him? If a brother or sister be naked and destitute of daily food, and one of you say unto him, Depart in peace, and be ye warmed and filled, notwithstanding that ye give not those things which are needful to the body, what does it profit? Even so faith, if it has not works, is dead, being alone. Yea, a man may say, Thou hast faith, and I have my works. Show me thy faith without thy works, and I will show thee my faith by my works. Thou believest that there is one God. Thou doest well. The devils also believe and tremble. Let me stop right there. I find that one there, that, that particular verse there, very fascinating. There's so many people, everybody thinks they're going to heaven today. Mm -hmm. You ask someone, are you a Christian? Or, you know, some time ago I had gone with a group of Bible college students. We'd gone into the inner city and we was doing street ministry. And they told us the first question to ask somebody was, if you were to die right now, would you go to heaven or hell? Did you know that not one single person in this world said they was going to hell? Nobody wants to admit that they've done wrong. And so we began to talk to them and, and we ask them and, and we teach them what the Bible says. And we ask them, well, have you ever stolen anything? And they said, yeah. Well, what does that make you? A thief. Have you ever told a lie? Yes. What does that make you? That makes you a liar. Ha have you ever looked at someone with lust? And they said, well, yeah. I said, well, that makes you an adulterer. And they said, okay. And I said, so this is what you said. You said, by your own admission, you're a lying, thieving, adulterer. And if you was to stand before God on judgment day, what would your judgment be? And they said, well, I guess I'd be guilty. And I said, so you're not on your way to heaven after all, are you? And so people do not understand what God's Word teaches. That's why it's important that the church reaches out and shares the love of Christ with them to teach them the truth of God's Word. And when we know the truth of God's Word, the Holy Spirit convicts us because when we would witness to these people and we taught them the truth of God's Word, they recognized then that no, they're not saved. That they're not on their way to heaven and they realized that something had to be done. They had to pray. They had to repent of their sin. They had to turn their life over to Jesus Christ. 
So it says, Thou believest that there is one God. Thou doest well. The devils also believe in trim. See, Satan believes in God. He really believes in it because he's, he's dreading the time when he's going to have to stand before him again. The devil believes in him and he fears and he trembles him. But just because he believes in him does not mean he's saved. You're not going to have a saved devil. The verse, the Bible goes on to say, but, but wilt thou know, O vain man, that faith without works is dead? Was not Abraham our father justified by works when he had offered Isaac his son upon the altar? Seest thou how faith wrought with its works, and by works was made per was faith made perfect? And the scripture was fulfilled, which saith, Abraham believed God, and it was imputed unto him for righteousness, and he was called the friend of God. You see then how that by works a man is justified, and not by faith only. Likewise also was not Rahab the harlot justified by works when she had received the messengers and had sent them out another way. For as the body without the spirit is dead, so faith without works is dead also. And sometimes I wonder, does anyone in this world have a clue what it means to be obedient to the word of God? See, we can think what we want to think. We can say what we want to say. We can go to church every time the doors are open. We can read our Bible. We can pray every day. We can even work in the ministries of the church. But unless we come to a point in our life when we are totally obedient to the commandments of Jesus Christ, we are not saved. We must be obedient to His Word. Going to church is not what saves us. Singing in the choir is not what saves us. It's our obedience to Him when we repent of our sin and we turn from the sinful lifestyle. We voluntarily abandon that sin. We turn the other, other direction. We go a new direction and we obey Him and we serve Him with all of our heart. And unless we do that, we're not saved. Amen. And so Jesus explains the principle of being obedient to His commandments. And I like this verse in John chapter 14. Verse 15 through 25. This is what Jesus said. It's a conditional. Salvation is a conditional lifestyle. He said, if you love me, keep my commandments. And I will pray the Father, and he shall give you another comforter, that he may abide with you forever, even the Spirit of truth, whom the world cannot receive, because it seeth him not, neither knoweth him, but ye know him, for he dwelleth with you, and shall be in you. I will not leave you comfortless. I will come to you yet a little while, and the world seeth me no more. But ye see me, because I live, ye shall live also. At that day ye shall know that I am in my Father, and ye in me, and I in you. He that hath my commandments, and keepeth them, he it is that loveth me. Did you hear what he said? He said, he that has my commandments, he it is that loves me. And he that loves me shall be loved of my Father, and I will love him, and will manifest myself to him. Mm -hmm. Judah saith unto him, not Iscariot, Lord, how is it that thou will manifest thyself unto us, and not unto the world? Jesus answered and said unto him, If a man love me, he will keep my words, Amen. and my Father will love him, and we will come unto him, and make our abode with him. He that loveth me not, keepeth not my sayings. And the word which ye hear is not mine, but the Father's which sent me. These things have I spoken unto you, being yet present with you. So in order to be filled with the baptism of the Holy Ghost Church, we must be obedient to the commandments written in the Word of God. Amen. So we, we receive the Holy Spirit when we're spending time in prayer. We receive the Holy Spirit when we're being obedient to the Word of God. Also, we receive the Holy Spirit when we are being humble before God. Mm -hmm. We cannot receive the Holy Spirit if we are full of pride and envy. Jesus said in Matthew chapter 18, verse 14, He says, Whosoever, therefore, shall humble himself as a little child, the same is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. In James chapter 4, verse 6, Jesus said, But he gives more grace, wherefore he saith, God resisteth the proud, but gives grace unto the humble. In James chapter 4, verse 10, Humble yourselves in the sight of the Lord, and he shall lift you up. 
In 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 6, Humble yourselves, therefore, under the mighty hand of God, that He may exalt you in due time. We've been talking about on our Wednesday night Bible study a few weeks ago on overcoming hindrances to receiving the baptism in the Holy Ghost. And the first thing that we need to overcome in our life is pride. So many people have so much pride built up and they're afraid of what someone's going to think about them. They're afraid that someone may, may criticize them or think that they're being too emotional and they think, well, I just want to get the Holy Ghost in a dignified way. I don't want to get all emotional. I don't want to shed all these tears and, and make a mess up here at the front. Church, we, we must get beside all of that emotion and, and learn to humble ourselves before God and just get over it and become and just understand that if, if God be for you, who can be against you? If God wants to fill you with His power, let Him fill you. Don't worry about what you look like. Don't worry about what it sounds like. You just let go and let God have His way and humble yourself before Him and let Him lift you up. Sometimes it's difficult though. For us to embrace the idea of going in front of the church and, and lifting up our hands and, and everyone watching us. That's why a few weeks ago when I gave the altar call, I told Sister Alyssa to turn the TV camera on. I don't want anyone to feel like they're being intimidated and, and being put on display. And we edit these services and, and whenever we give the altar call, we, we cut the tape and, and we edit it. We don't show that on there because... This is a personal time between us and God. And I want, I want you as a church to realize that, that even though, yes, we're, we're trying to put our services out there so the world can see. The world needs to see what Pentecost is. But at the same time, we are not trying to hinder a move of God in this church. Don't worry about what people out there think about us. If they're going to laugh at us, they're going to laugh at us anyway. You see, they're already accusing us of being Pentecostal. They already think that we're in here running the aisles and, and shouting and jumping the pews. So why do we let them down sometimes? We're afraid that people are going to think that we're, we're just showing out. We're afraid that someone's going to make fun of us and, and call us a holy roller or a super spiritual. Church, we need to let go of all of that criticism and just let God have His way Amen. in our life. Amen. One day the disciples of Jesus were talking among themselves. And some of them were probably boasting about what they had been doing in the ministry. And while I'm out on this limb, uh, I, I always believe in, in giving credit where credit is due. We have a wonderful, wonderful church here. In fact, to me, this is the greatest church that I know of. But this church is not what it is today. Listen carefully. It's not what it is today because of me. It takes every single one of us. Yes, I'm the pastor. But I have a board of deacons. We have a secretary, treasurer. We have a Sunday school superintendent. I cannot be in all of these Sunday school rooms and, and working in the nursery and working in the kitchen. You don't want my cooking anyway. But it takes every single one of us working together. When we had our Valentine's banquet, I brought out the idea. Our women's ministry took it and they ran with it and they did an incredible job. And I thought, why did I even try to come up with an idea? They do it so much better than I do. Each one of us has our own talents and our own gifts. It takes us all working together. But some time ago, I had an opportunity to be in a church service with Pastor Bill Wilson. Some of you may have heard of him. Uh, he pastors Metro Ministries in New York City. Has probably the largest bus ministry in the United States. And they average somewhere between uh, 25 to 30,000 children in their children's ministry each week. And uh, Brother Johnny, how would you like to have a bus ministry that brought in 25 to 30,000 kids from the ghettos of New York City? <laughs> but while he was there, he was talking about a minister's conference that he was speaking at one day. And he said this bright young preacher came up to him and just literally started bragging to him. And he said, Pastor Bill, I have been pastor at this church and I have built this church up from, from, from this amount of people to this amount of people. And while I have been pastor, I have been able to oversee this ministry. And I've been able to do this. And I have been able to do that. And he was just really praising himself. And Pastor Bill Wilson just kind of laughed and looked at him and he said, well, let's just give all glory and honor to God. 
But why are you telling me all of this? Why are you bragging to me about it? Or you want me to reward you? Or, or you want me to give you a cookie for, for, for what you're doing? You know, sometimes people brag about it. and They're wanting people to notice them. And they want people to say, oh, yeah, well, look at him. He's doing a great good job there. No, that's not what we are to do. That's why the Bible tells us when we do something for the Lord, do it in secret. Don't let people know what we're doing. Don't let people know how much you're giving in the offering. It's none of their business. It's between you and God. And yes, we may work together. We're going to try to do everything we can to reach out to this community and build this church. But it's not what I have done. It's not what you have done. But it's what we allow God to do in us and through us. And it's only possible when we receive the anointing and the power of the Holy Ghost. It's by His grace and His grace alone. Amen. So the disciples were having a very similar situation. They were having a bragging party to each other. And some of them was was talking and, and one probably said well I, I got to walk on water to go toward Jesus Christ so I'm probably going to be one of the greatest in the kingdom of heaven and then another disciple said yeah but but I'm, I'm the beloved disciple and, and I get to walk with them and so I'm probably going to be the greatest in the kingdom of heaven and then some other disciples probably spoke up. Judas may have spoke up. I can only imagine Judas he probably said well I'm Jesus' treasure I'm probably going to be the greatest because I hold the money that sounds like a lot of our justices of the peace and our Congress in this world today. They think they're the greatest. But so they got to arguing and, 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 and just could not come to an agreement. So they thought, let's just take it to Jesus and we'll ask Jesus which one of us is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. Yeah. I love his response to them. Amen. They ask him and they're coming up to him. They probably all ran up to him and almost knocked him over. I can only imagine what it was be like and they say Lord which one of us is the greatest is it me no Lord is it me which one of us is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven Jesus just put his hands up for a second I'm sure he trying to calm him down called a little child over to him said that little child beside him and said unless you humble yourself like this little child yeah. unless you humble yourself like this little child you're not going right. think, about think about that you put them in their place it's not about what we do. Amen. It's about Him. Amen. It's Him. He's the one. It's His church. It's not our church. Jesus said, upon this rock, I will build my church. It's His church. It's His Father's house. In the book of Revelation, one of the, the most tragic stories that I've ever seen of a church. I, I've got off of my outline, but I'm going to step out here. Because we're seeing it so many times in, in the church world today. But James, if you'll go out that door for just a second. Stand on the other side of that door. He said, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hear my voice and open the door. James, if you'll knock on that door and keep knocking until someone opens that door. But when we look in the Word of God and He says, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. He's not talking about He's knocking at the door of a sinner. He's talking about the church. How did we get to a point where Jesus was having to stand on the outside of the church doors, knocking on it? You see, we, we got so... so situated in our churches with our entertainment and with our, our games and our philosophies and our own vain teachings and our self-help programs that we put Jesus aside and we no longer preach a message of repentance and we no longer teach a message of holiness and we no longer tell people that without holiness no man shall see the Lord. We do not tell people that they need to repent or else they're never going to see the kingdom of God. We never tell people that they need to be born again or else they're never going to... To, to receive eternal life. And all the time Jesus is there. He's trying to get into the church. But the church has put Jesus out. And he's standing outside the doors of the church. He said if anyone will hear my voice. If anyone will hear my voice and open the door, I will come into him and I will sup with him and he with me. Church, we need to let this world know that this is the church of Jesus Christ. This is a house of worship. This is a place where the lost can repent and sinners can be saved and the hungry can be filled and the thirsty can be satisfied. This is a place where, where people can receive the baptism of the Holy Ghost, where the sick can be healed, where lives can 
can be changed and people can be set free by the power of God Almighty. We must humble ourselves and we must allow God to do the work in our life that He wants to do. Hallelujah. Can we stand together across the sanctuary? Come Holy Spirit we need. Come Holy Spirit we pray. Come in thy strength and thy power. Come in thine own gentle way. Church, if we can just get to a point in our life where we are just being obedient to the Word of God and we yield to His blessings and we surrender our will to Him, He will fill us with His power. He will fill us with His baptism of the Holy Ghost. If we will submit to Him and humble ourselves to Him and seek His face, He will heal us. He will bless us. He will fill us with the baptism of the Holy Ghost. Can we come to this front and let's let's lift up the name of Jesus and let's surrender to Him and praise His name for He is worthy of all praise. Yesterday, today, and forever. He is worthy of all of the praise. Hallelujah to your name, Jesus. Come, Holy Spirit. Come, Holy Spirit. Come, Holy Spirit. I need thee, Lord, come, sweet spirit, I pray, Lord, come, and I strength and thy power. Centennial Camp Meeting at First Assembly of God in Howe, Oklahoma.